This video is about decision making in Smash, so we'll start off with a pop quiz. In this scenario, what is the next best move for Marth? Is it A, short hop nair, B, down tilt, C, wave dash back, or D, F smash? Let's consider the merits of each. Short hop auto cancel nair can catch Fox trying to jump and could possibly combo into a grab. Down tilt might be fast enough to catch Fox trying to dash away and would make it hard for him to counter hit off a crouch cancel. Wave dash back allows you to avoid any immediate aggression from Fox and could set up for a dash back grab if he decides to approach. F smash is a strong move, but it's laggy and can be crouch cancelled at low percent. So what option would you pick? If you have your answer, let's roll the clip. As you can see, the correct answer was D, F smash. Marth, knowing that Fox would dash away and jump, correctly chose F smash and earned the early kill. Nair would have whiffed, down tilt probably wouldn't have led to a kill, and wave dash back would have just reset neutral. But those outcomes depend on Fox having dashed and jumped away like he did. In 99 out of 100 cases, any of those other options probably would have been fine. If I'm being honest, this wasn't a fair quiz because I didn't provide you with all the information. In reality, this moment occurred after two games had already passed, so the Marth player, in this case me, wasn't going in blind. With the information available to me so far, I felt confident going for a big callout to get the early kill. But let's say you did have all that information. Would you change your answer? In the heat of battle, I didn't have the benefit of freezing that moment and analyzing every option in front of me. It was an instinctual decision. But it wasn't uninformed either, as I had two full games of information to base my decision on. All the same, taking a risk on a read like that is never a sure thing. So why did I make that play? To answer this question, I will break down two key elements of decision making in fighting games. Guiding principles, and the inner mechanics of making decisions in a match. First, we'll review what these elements are, and then we'll discuss how to leverage their relationship to one another to improve your decision making capabilities. Every player's decision making process is steered by a set of guiding principles. Due to the sheer complexity of fighting games, an objective best option is most of the time non-existent. As a result, players tend to adhere to a system of principles that helps break down the influx of data into more digestible pieces. The system could be focused on player-specific data such as defensive habits and approach options, or it could be focused on common interactions in a matchup. One of the most popular theories on this is the concept of heart, body, and mind. The idea is that every player has a primary affinity with one of the three, and that affinity encompasses the way they play the game. In this context, let's consider each affinity as an example of guiding principles. This is my take on what each affinity means. A mind-based player is one who focuses on breaking down specific interactions in pursuit of optimal punishes. Not only do they know the most optimal routes, but they influence the flow of the game such that those situations are more likely to arise. A heart-based player is one who feels out their opponents so they can plan their moves based on the opponent's habits. This could mean foregoing a guaranteed punish in favor of a riskier but stronger option. The body affinity is one that most people have trouble defining. In my view, the body affinity manifests in robust game plans that are highly refined and informed by knowledge of the meta. These players are very difficult to outplay without comparable game knowledge or without multiple hard callouts. The last time I was in a room with Laud, Junebug, and Zane, we went around to try and determine which affinity we each identified best with. Anyone who has talked to Laud wouldn't be surprised to hear that we put him into the mind affinity, given how deeply he looks into every interaction. I recommend checking out his guide on improvement if you want to see just how far he's pushed his analysis in that regard. Junebug's affinity is also mind. He's a highly analytical player, and most people don't know this, but he was one of the first players to optimize the use of crouch cancel in neutral in the way we see it today. Zane falls into the body category. Everything he does in game is so well refined that beating him in one of his strong matchups feels virtually impossible, and as time goes on, every matchup is becoming a strong matchup for Zane. As for me, based on the scenario we reviewed earlier, you might have already guessed that we assigned me the heart affinity, given my proclivity toward making big plays based on my opponent's habits. One litmus test for identifying a player's affinity is to consider the advice they give. For example, when Laud gives advice, he's often speaking in absolute terms, claiming to have figured out the answer to a matchup. 
In his words, the answer could be something as simple as full hop up air. This is indicative that he's more consciously focused on specific matchup interactions than on the overall game plan or player habits. When Zane gives advice, it's often in the form of some handy bullets that comprise a game plan, such as use down tilt in this spot to bait out jumps. I think that heart players have a harder time articulating advice because they're more focused on feeling out the flow of the game. It's why when you hear Mango or Nun talk about the game, they don't typically talk about specific move interactions or matchup strategy, they keep it more abstract. Now before you categorize yourself into one of these affinities, let me ask, do you think Mango's sole focus is on player habits and not on a robust strategy? Do you think Zane only focuses on his overall game plan and not on routing out the most optimal punishes? Of course, the answer is no. While any top player might primarily drive their decision making from one affinity, you can't survive long at that level without pushing your abilities in all three. With that in mind, let's move on to the second key element of decision making, the inner mechanics. Within each competitor lies two entities, the analyst and the doer. The analyst is making observations, processing information, and guiding further decisions. The doer is actually playing the game. In the fast-paced environment of a competitive fighting game like Smash, it's impossible to let the analyst fully take over the wheel. We don't have the luxury of freezing every moment and taking our sweet time with an analysis. Most of the time, we have to rely on our instincts, and that comes from the doer. But you need the analyst as well to assess new information and make adjustments to the doer's actions. This idea is pretty similar to the premise of the inner game of tennis, so I highly recommend you check that book out if this interests you. Think back to the affinities we just discussed. Where do heart, body, and mind fit into the process between the analyst and the doer? Let's consider for a moment that the analyst has three facets, one for each affinity. That is to say, you have a heart analyst tracking your opponent's habits and weighing the risk-reward of going for reads. You have a body analyst measuring each action against your game plan and making adjustments accordingly. And you have a mind analyst calculating the most favorable outcomes in each situation. While we could categorize a player like Leffen as a body affinity player, if you tested his ability to analyze interactions, habits, and game plans out of 100, he would ace all three tests. One of the most common traps for fighting game players is pigeonholing yourself into one category. If you start telling yourself that you're a reads-based player, then analyzing reads is all you end up doing. The inner analyst lives in the part of your mind that utilizes conscious thinking. It focuses on problem solving, so it walks through the logic of every problem and tries to find a solution. As such, it's possible to train your inner analyst's ability to solve problems in all three categories. This is what you're doing when you analyze matches or ask advice from top players. However, as I mentioned earlier, most of your in-game decision making is actually driven by the inner doer. When you're in the middle of a match, you can't stop and analyze every situation. You have to rely on your instincts to make decisions on the fly. Being in tune with your instincts is a key part of maintaining flow state, or accessing peak performance, or playing in the zone, whatever you want to call it. However, if you rely solely on instincts without any conscious thought, you end up playing on autopilot. Therefore, you must temper the inner doer with the inner analyst. Learning to complement your instincts with your analytical mind is pivotal for performing at your peak. It's difficult, because an overly active analytical mind can distract from your instincts and actually knock you out of your flow state. Finding the right balance is one of the hardest endeavors for any fighting game player, and it takes a lot of work. The first step in finding this balance is to identify the nature of your own instincts. Whereas any player can train their inner analyst to improve problem solving related to the heart, body, and mind, it's a bit harder to tell your instincts what to do. I'll offer my own experience as an example. I have often been told that one of my strengths is getting a read on my opponents and turning that information into a big play. It's the reason so many of my victories have been seemingly hopeless games that I somehow managed to win. In fact, my brother often tells me he doesn't think I really start trying until I'm completely cornered and my back is against the wall. My set against Zane from the Big House 8 is a good showcase of this. Zane takes early leads throughout the set with his strong game plans and dominant neutral play. Whenever I was put on the back foot, I would let my instincts take over, guided by the analyst's assessment of my opponent's habits, and make a big play to put myself back in the running. But what if I never lost the lead in the first place? I could train my body analyst, but would still need to practice guiding my instincts with that analyst in the lead. 
It's definitely possible, but requires a great deal of practice and discipline. That said, there are players who have achieved this, and one in particular comes to mind. Hungrybox is known far and wide as the most clutch player in the world. Although he plays one of the most fragile characters in the game, the way he utilizes her movement and defensive options makes him feel untouchable. And yet, the moments that define him aren't how many times he's consecutively outplayed his opponent. It's the singular moments at the end of a set where he finds the kill seemingly out of nowhere. He keeps track of his opponent's habits, he knows the setups and mix-up situations that let him find his kill moves, and by the time you're at the last hit situation, he's already spent minutes conditioning you through his methodical game plan. This is an example of all these affinities coming together, and it's what makes him very, very hard to beat. No matter how high pressure the situation may be, he's able to accurately identify his win conditions and guide his instincts with precision. This is how he's able to win tournament after tournament. So let's recap. Within each of us, there is an inner analyst and a doer. The analyst represents our conscious thinking, the part of us that processes information and comes up with solutions. The doer is where our instincts live. It's how we're able to keep up with the fast-paced nature of a game like Smash. To improve as a competitor, you must consider both the analyst and the doer, and the relationship between the two. Maybe the heart, body, and mind framework resonated with you, and maybe it didn't. I often tell Lod that he's a melee Sith and I'm a Jedi. Whatever the case may be, it's important to become familiar with the nature of your inner doer, and to train the problem-solving abilities of your inner analyst. My goal with this video was to at least give you the tools to begin that conversation. Do you have a different set of guiding principles that I didn't cover here? Or do you have another way of looking at the analyst-doer relationship? This is an abstract topic, so no framework will ever be perfect. But I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the matter, so let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and good luck. Oh, you're still here. Waiting for something that never came, huh? Well... You're in luck. In the secret part three of this video, I want to talk about the third inner self that lives alongside the analyst and the doer. The third self is exclusive to Fox players and it's called the inner complex.